Welcome to the Unconventional Path, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Stories and Ideas. Hi, I'm Bela Musitz. I'm a former three-time entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and the recently retired David D. Ray Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Clarkson University. And I'm Mike Wasserman, Professor of International Management at the Münster University of Applied Sciences in Münster, Germany. First, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy listening to our podcast episode as much as we've enjoyed creating it. And second, uh, we always like to make it clear why we're doing this. Uh, It's clearly not for the money, but uh, Bailey and I both like to learn from smart and interesting people about how the world's changing. Uh, We're especially interested in how innovation and entrepreneurship are changing. And we like to overlay our observations and compare them with the lessons we've each learned over three plus decades as entrepreneurs, investors, managers, and professors. To do this, we put together our network of interesting friends, former students, and business partners, along with other people we've met recently along the way to bring you interesting stories, ideas, and insights into innovation, entrepreneurship, and the people that take unconventional paths to find happiness at work and in life. Well, Mike, today's guest is Victoria Yampolsky. She is a computer science graduate from Cornell University, has her MBA from Columbia, and has worked on Wall Street, has also been a film producer, and is a founder of The Startup Station. The Startup Station helps entrepreneurs refine their business model, refine their financial models, and in general, uh, helps uh, young entrepreneurs kind of uh, develop their business and grow their business. So she fills a unique niche, uh, maybe not unique, but she fills a niche in helping entrepreneurs get some of the uh, advice and counsel uh, in a way that's slightly different than, let's say, getting an MBA or being part of an incubator. So uh, what did you think about this one, Mike? I think this is really cool, Bela. I mean, we so far over the last, what, it's almost a year now, right, that we've been doing this, um, we've looked at a variety of pathways uh, to entrepreneurship. We've looked at a variety of ways that uh, you might think about wanting to shift your career from a corporate job to entrepreneurship, or if you're right out of school, how you can uh, build a path that's fulfilling um, and successful. Um, so this is cool. We haven't really delved into this. It's it's uh, kind of a uh, a newer approach. It leverages technology. Um, it's you know probably competition to what you and I have spent the last uh, decade or two doing as part of uh, higher education institutions. Um, but I think it's really got value and it's worth talking about and it's worth thinking about um, and using it as part of an entrepreneur's toolkit uh, as a path to success. Yeah, I think you're 100 percent right, Mike. You know, as, as various different industries mature, and I'll say entrepreneurship is sort of an industry, uh, you start getting more and more alternatives in being able to enter that industry, uh, get educated about that industry, et cetera. And this is just another example of that. So uh, with that, let's dive into the interview with Victoria. Hello, listeners. Bela here. Today, I'm connected via Skype with Victoria Yampolsky. She is a Cornell Comp computer science grad, a Columbia MBA, has worked on Wall Street, is a film producer, and is founder of the Startup Station. Welcome, Victoria. Thank you very much, Bella. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation. So let me start off with asking you a question. If you were at a uh, business-related cocktail party, and someone came up to you and introduced themselves, and then they ask you, uh, Victoria, what do you do? How would you answer that question? Uh, depending on uh, what party it is, I would give uh, a more in-depth answer or a very short answer. If it's a party that it's no way connected to uh, what I'm doing for a living, I would just say that I work with startups and I help them make money. If it is a party that is a little bit connected to what I do for a living, uh, I would say that I help model and value early stage ventures. So uh, great. Uh, I like your I like your last answer. So what do you mean by model and value uh, startup ventures? Well, our early stage ventures have a a lot of challenges when it comes to uh, building their first financial projections because there's no financial history. And yet for any venture that it's launching, it's very important to create a financial plan so that you're able to evaluate the financial feasibility of your business model. 
and B, you're able to evaluate how effective your strategy is as you start executing. Because so many early stage ventures have to completely change their business models, which is called pivoting. And the earlier they're able to figure out that they need to do it, the earlier they're able to react to market feedback, the less capital they spend and they increase their chances of success. So I firmly believe that it is absolutely important for any company to uh, do the rigorous financial analysis. And yet it is extremely difficult to do for a company with no financial history because it's not clear how to create assumptions. And this forms the basis for my expertise where I've developed uh, courses around in a consulting practice and free resources where I help founders to figure that out so that uh, they are able to succeed uh, as entrepreneurs. Uh, very nice. So walk me through that process a little bit. So if I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur and I, I, I have a rough version of my business plan, but my financial pro formas are a disaster, uh, take me through how you would work with me on that. Sure. So uh, the process consists of four parts. If I'm working with you one on one and you're not taking uh, my classes, which allow you to learn how to do it yourself. So the first part of the process is uh, evaluation of all the materials, if you have any. So this would include at the minimum your investors presentation, any financials, your marketing plans, your uh, competitive research, you know, any strategic uh, plans that you've put together. And this gives me an idea of uh, A, uh, which monetization opportunities you're thinking to execute for your company and B, what costs you may have in order to execute those monetization opportunities. Sometimes I work with founders that don't really have an investor's presentation yet. They are uh, much earlier stage than others. And in that case, I have a questionnaire uh, that we go through with an idea of getting the same information out of them which is how do you make money, when do you launch your revenue streams, what are your costs, at which point are you going to incur those costs, what are the interdependencies between the costs and different revenue streams, et cetera, et cetera. And by the time that uh, we are done with a questionnaire, we use it as a guide for creating financial model assumptions. And that uh, brings us to the second part of the process where we create it. We're first focused on revenues. Revenues is the most challenging um, part of the financial model to build for an early stage startup because it's a reflection of the company's business plan, right? And it needs to be translated into the financial plan correctly and comprehensively, specifically when it comes to modeling how a company will generate demand. Right? Because an ability to see whether you're able to generate demand as you're expecting is key to being able to react quickly to market feedback and to pivot <clears throat> if you need to, which is the problem that a lot of startups, like I've mentioned before, face. Um, so once we formulate all of the assumptions for the revenue stream, we do the same, the revenue streams, we do the same for costs. Uh, and then we come to the third part of the process, which is the modeling. Uh, and so we build everything. So we create a full financial model with, uh, you know, underlying revenue projections and a financial analysis portion and the use of funds portion and evaluation portion and the working capital portion, which is I'm using a lot of the finance terms. So for those who are not familiar, uh, it's basically uh, a complete financial model. Um, and then the fourth part of the process is uh, review and adjustment. So why do we need that? Uh, when we take our initial assumptions, this is our initial view of what the business model of a company will look like. And we don't yet know whether that's going to be profitable or not, right? Because it's not possible to predict what's how it's going to work mathematically once you put all of the information together. And so all the models that I built always have to go through a review process where you rethink part of your business plan. Sometimes significantly, sometimes insignificantly, but always to some extent. And then you make adjustments to your underlying inputs. And as a result, you come up with a much better business plan and a financial plan than that you started with before this exercise. And um, this exercise allows founders to look into their business on a much deeper and profound level and really ask themselves serious questions in terms of how they see their business, what commitments they will need to make in order to grow their business, to do even more research into the industry and competition and pricing and marketing that they did before, strategic partnerships, whatever the case is for their business model, uh, and allows them to be better prepared to be successful. 
Very, very nice. So if I put my venture capital hat on, uh, I will tell you that, you know, I've sat in in our office and had uh, entrepreneurs come in and give us pitches for their business. Mm -hmm. And it's oftentimes very evident uh, when the entrepreneurs had uh, hired someone to either help them write the business plan or develop the business plan uh, or the financial models because their depth of understanding was pretty shallow. So I was encouraged by you, you saying that you also provide some education here. So it's not like uh, as an entrepreneur, I ship off a bunch of information to you. You create a model, you throw it back over the wall. Because I think one of the important lessons here is that the entrepreneur needs to be able to understand that and defend it and substantiate it to a potential investor that he's pitching it to. So talk a little bit about how you do that with the entrepreneurs. Um, sure. Um, so when I consult entrepreneurs, I coach them on how to present uh, the financial data to investors. And we use the financial data uh, in their investor presentations. And they are intimately involved in making decisions about all of the assumptions and the underlying logic on which the business model is built. So they know already by the time we finish the model how um, it's going to work. What I also do is I put together sometimes what I call evaluation report, which describes where all of the assumptions are coming from and the underlying logic for the business model, which also helps entrepreneurs to present the financial data to investors. Now, for those entrepreneurs that don't have any finance background and need to learn the language of investors, such as accounting and finance, I do offer um, courses, right? And I've developed those courses over the past three years. It's a curriculum specifically designed for founders with little to no finance experience uh, and specifically focused on early stage ventures. It covers five subjects. There are two tracks for software and service startups and for product startups. Um, both tracks consist of five courses. Uh, the first course is accounting and financial analysis. The second course is the basics of financial modeling, where I teach them how to think about projecting price and quantity and focus on specific assumptions for eight business models for both software and service startups and product startups. Obviously, those classes are very different because those startups have completely different ways in how to, they monetize their uh, business. The third class is the same for both tracks. It's the valuation class, uh, where I describe valuation concepts and eight different valuation models used to value early stage ventures. Three of them are quantitative and five of them are qualitative for those cases where you cannot build any projections. Uh, the fourth class is the case study, where we put together a full financial model start to finish. They're able to download that model and then modify it based on the financial modeling class they took or their needs if they're able to do it themselves. And finally, the fifth class is the financing class. And there I talk about how to look for investors, the, how you create investors lists. Um, different stages of financing, and I specifically focus on three financing vehicles, uh, which are SAFE, which stands for Simple Agreement for Future Equity, Convertible Debt, and Equity, and how to negotiate better term sheets with investors, like which things do founders need to be aware of. Because oftentimes, if you don't have finance background, not only can you not build financial projections, you also don't really understand the term sheet that investors are handing to you. And uh, specifically, convertible debt vehicle, which is very often used on the East Coast, is a complex vehicle, which was not traditionally created for funding startups. And um, it has some uh, things in there that people need to be aware of. I feel so that uh, it's a level playing field. And so um, that's why I included that as part of my curriculum. Very nice. So how do you deliver this, uh, this material to the people who take your course? Sure. So I used to teach um, in-person workshops in New York City, and then there was so much demand that uh, last year I've put my curriculum online. So right now I have the software and service track available uh, online completely and parts of the product track. And I'm going to probably put it completely online by the end of the summer. Uh, in addition to that, everybody who takes my online classes can attend live virtual classes that I teach uh, about every two to three months. And I teach the whole curriculum uh, uh, online in an interactive environment as well. 
but I no longer teach in person unless I'm invited to speak at conferences or events or, you know, there is a special situation going on. Yes. And approximately how long does it take if I if I'm going to take the courses online? Is that sort of self-paced? Do I go at my own pace or is there a more structured uh, program? Uh, You can go at your own pace. The classes are about two hours long. I recommend at least uh, six to eight weeks to take the curriculum because if you've never taken finance, you need to be able to eat, digest uh, the material and also be to do research uh, for uh, the assumptions that are specific to your financial model and your business and to really think about the decisions and the implications of those decisions um, that you're making. And so that takes time. So even when I'm working with clients directly, a process of building your financial model still takes four to six weeks of the overall time, even though of my time, it only takes 30 to 40 hours for um, uh, a software startup and 40 to 50 for a product startup. But overall, it takes about one and a half months just because founders need to uh, really understand what they're doing. And oftentimes when they come to me, they think they have all the information and it very quickly becomes evident that they don't. And then they spend about a month getting all the information together. Yes, yes. Very nice. So uh, if I'm an entrepreneur and I'm interested in uh, engaging with you in something like this, um, how do we talk to me about sort of what that might cost me? Sure. So um, the um, classes, uh, each class is $100. uh, And uh, it includes lifetime access to all the videos and materials, which are both PowerPoint and Excel examples, as well as 100 practice questions. The more classes you buy, you the more discount you get. So it's up to 20%. There is one class that is more expensive. Um, it's a key study class because it contains a financial model. A uh, financial model can also be bought separately for $200. Otherwise, this class is $300. And if somebody wanted to take an entire curriculum, um, it is um, $600 for wow. uh, five classes. Yeah, that's pretty reasonable if you ask me. I wow, think so great. for 600 yeah. questions and a model and that. And they get, you know, to ask me questions. They get to also attend live sessions if they want, uh, et cetera. Now, if somebody wants to try the material, they can just attend the live sessions. The live sessions are two-hour classes. They're only priced at $40. Uh, and then, But you don't get the materials or lifetime access or anything, but you can apply the money that you spend towards the online class, or you can buy materials separately after class as well. So I'm very flexible in a way how I offer teaching because my big mission is to drive entrepreneurship uh, to, you know, as many places around the globe as possible. And I'm actually excited to announce that I am launching my curriculum in India and Russia uh, in the next couple of months. Oh, wow. Wow. That's a big step. Yep. Yeah. It's uh, quite nice. Yeah. Through the partners that I've uh, developed. Yeah. So if someone wants to find you and uh, learn more about uh, this education opportunity and learning opportunity, uh, how would they do that? Uh, well, it's everything is on my website, www.thestartupstation.com. And for somebody who's just a beginner, um, they can go to resources. Um, there is a YouTube channel where um, I publish weekly videos on different um, subjects of financial modeling, financing, how to run an early stage startup, et cetera. Uh, and there is a corresponding blog. So if you prefer to read, you can write a, read a blog. If you prefer to watch a video, you can uh, watch a video. A blog is oh. a little bit more comprehensive than a video, I would say. So by the time I write a blog, I've already thought about it extensively. Yeah, excellent. So I will make sure to include uh, startupstation.com in the show notes for folks. That will be wonderful. Yes, thank you. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, so uh, talk to me a little bit about your background and, and how you ended up uh, in this uh, wonderful endeavor and, and, and the path that you've taken. Mm. Uh, I think, like me, you're an immigrant to this country. I am an immigrant, uh, yes. I am from, originally from St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, I've been here for close to 25 years. Uh, and um, I would say that it was a journey for me to um, 
discover entrepreneurship as a career that makes me happy and makes me feel fulfilled creatively and quantitatively. Uh, you know, I have, a, like you've mentioned before, computer science degree from Cornell. Uh, it's provided me with absolutely phenomenal training in terms of uh, being able to analyze information and dissect information and problem solve. And I use it even though I don't program anymore. Um, or actually, ever since I graduated, I've done program, uh, but I use my degree in various ways every day for uh, basically every career opportunity that I've had. So after business school, I'm sorry, after uh, Cornell, I did um, IT consulting, um, and then I didn't really like it. Uh, and then I tried to go to business school, and I tried to go to Wall Street, and I didn't like it either. And then I decided to pursue my creative endeavors, and I started a film company. And uh, I know it seems like quite a departure from my quantitative endeavors before, but actually I was an actress as a child for um, eight years. So for me, it was a continuation of something that I've already loved and just uh, stopped doing for a while. And I didn't want to be an actress anymore. I wanted to try my hand in producing. And so I tried to do that for two years uh, for a multitude of reasons that didn't work out. And after that, uh, very organically, I realized that the same problem that the film producers faced, which were they were completely uh, inept when it came to uh, um, monetizing their intellectual property, which are films, right? They didn't really think about the packaging. They didn't really think about distribution. They didn't really think about genre, like which actors would help to attach in order to um, uh, generate certain financing options. The, we had the same problem in the startup community where there were a lot of really, really smart and talented people with deep technical or product expertise, but really no business acumen. And that resulted in them not being able to raise money, not being able to run their venture successfully, et cetera. And so that's how the startup station was born. And then um, in a few years, I began teaching entrepreneurs to give access to my expertise to a wider audience. And it grown to the current point. So it was a pretty organic journey for me, but it wasn't something that I thought I'm going to be doing when I was five years old. Yeah. You know, I think you're the third or fourth uh, person that has been on this podcast who has a background from the performing arts. Really? And yes, it's amazing, you know, who who started in the performing arts and then branched into either starting their own business or doing, uh, in another case like yourself, uh, starting their own business, but also helping entrepreneurs or, and, and coaching uh, senior leadership. So uh, that's been a, an interesting thread in this uh, unconventional path that people take uh, right. in life. Well, yeah. I'm actually back to producing now uh, because I'm uh, producing a TV show that's filming next week in Montreal, uh, which I'm very excited about. Uh, and it's called The Social Movement. And the idea of the show is to have uh, four teams of CEOs um, 10 CEOs in each team solve four global impact issues uh, that basically can impact humanity. And of course, we understand that we can solve those issues fully within the confines of the show, but the idea is to test the limits of human creativity, to put really, really talented people under pressure and give them something that they're not familiar with and hope for that creativity spark that can really move, hopefully, the needle towards making a difference. And my role in the show is that I've designed the whole show from the business perspective. You know, what problems they're going to be solving, how the competition is going to go forward, how they're going to be judged. And I'm going to be working with all the teams on the show to make sure that they produce the desired deliverable by the end and they don't fail. So for me, it's an absolutely phenomenal opportunity to be involved in something that can make a difference and, you know, to kind of make a foray into the film industry again. Yeah, wow. So when might we be able to uh, watch this, uh, uh, the social movement TV show? So uh, it comes out on uh, Amazon Prime uh, next summer. And that's season one. So uh, I would imagine that season two will be filmed uh, next summer. And then it's going to come out in uh, 2021, etc. Uh, and I think it's going to be five episodes. I'm not, I mean, it hasn't been filmed yet. So I don't think they know for sure. But that's the plan. Wow. Wow. That's really phenomenal. Excellent. Thank you. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, not only are you teaching entrepreneurs on on how to be more successful, you're also an entrepreneur yourself because we just talked about the TV show. You talked about being a film producer. You now have the startup station. So, uh, 
what sort of made you cho- choose this path of starting your own businesses and being entrepreneurial versus, as you said, you tried working on Wall Street and you really didn't like it? Uh, talk about that experience a little bit and, and how, you, how, how that helped to motivate you. Um, I think for me, uh, as being a creative person, uh, working in a corporate environment felt a little bit stifling uh, because there weren't enough, like there there wasn't enough variety of things for me to do. And uh, for me uh, to keep me interested, I need to be involved in a lot of things and it needs to be a mixture of uh, creative things, people oriented things and um, quantitative things. And uh, any job... um, I think that is not me being a small company that is a little bit more structured, is not going to have all the elements, especially when I'm at the more junior level and I can't really contribute, you know, at the level where that would warrant me more flexibility. So I don't necessarily blame any specific company or a position that I held for not satisfying all of my needs because I was a junior person. I was a recent grant and I really had a lot to learn. And I'm very thankful for uh, both experiences. Uh, They've taught me a lot, Uh, especially, you know, my job on Wall Street taught me how to analyze companies. We were producing trade ideas um, for um, hedge funds every two weeks. And every two weeks, I would have to research for different companies and for new industries and look for trading opportunities. And so that training came uh, incredibly useful when I started working with startups or even when I started my first film company. I had a very good framework within which I could work. So I'm very thankful. Thankfully, it just wasn't as fulfilling for me uh, as I hoped, and the time demands uh, also conflicted with my family responsibilities after I had a child, so um, it wasn't worth it when I looked at the um, whole picture. And so for me, entrepreneurship is both uh, this amazing opportunity to do something meaningful, to have this incredibly interesting job where I get to meet so many interesting people uh, every day, and to be able to spend time with my child. And that is equally as important to me. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So you found a, a really nice uh, niche for yourself here, right. in balancing all the things that are important to you. Right. I've created the job that I love for myself. That's right. Yeah, which which is <laughs> which is like a a super ideal thing to do, right? When you can sort of take your passion, uh, the thing that you really love and turn it into um, a job or a career or or a way to make a living then you really have uh, an ideal situation where work doesn't feel like work. Right. Well, I mean, sometimes it still feels like work. But, well, yeah, uh, that's why we call it work. That's why we call it work. <laughs> but uh, yeah. it does bring me a lot of joy. And, uh, it, you know, it's very rewarding for me to work with people and see the results of my work or to teach. You know, I love teaching and uh, I love interacting with uh, the students. And uh, like all of the aspects of what I do um, are you know, bring me joy. And education actually is the focus of, uh, I'm hoping, the remainder of my career as I want to expand my curriculum to more and more countries and more within the U.S. Uh, and ex- then launch the same curriculum for small businesses and solve the problem of them not being able to really understand their financial results uh, that they get from uh, the bookkeeping um, offices or accountants, et cetera. And so education is really how I see myself contributing to um uh, the global small business um, world and the entrepreneurship world. Yeah, yeah. So if a, if a young entrepreneur uh, contacted you and said, you know, I have an idea for a business plan, uh, you know, I'm looking for some help and some consulting and figuring out how to launch this thing. Mm-hmm. But, but that person also said, she also said to you, you know, I'm not sure because they're a brand new grad. I'm not sure if I should start my business or should I go work uh, in some corporate job for a number of years? Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what advice would you give them? Well, I mean, um, I think um, there's no right time to uh, start a business. I think if you have an idea and you are young, uh, the risks, the downside risks for you are pretty small. You don't yet have a lot of responsibilities except your student loans. So if you can figure out uh, a situation where you're able to meet your financial obligations, I would say, you know, pursue your passions because we only have one life to live. Uh, in terms of, uh, and it also depends what uh, career opportunities they have. If they have a really good offer from a company that is in a field that they want to learn, uh, or it's in a group where they really like the people that they can learn from, you know, 
it could be worth it um, taking a job for a couple of years and then uh, starting on that and their idea later. And it also depends whether at which stage their idea is. Is it an idea that they had yesterday or is it an idea that they've been developing for the past year and they have a team around this idea, they've validated demand, they've done market research, they've done competitive research. So how much work have they put into that idea? The more work they put in, the harder to leave that idea behind, especially if it's a good idea. The less work they put in, then the job that pays money seems like a better idea. So I would say it's, it's going to be a different answer for everybody, but I'm always happy to talk to absolutely any entrepreneur and give them my best advice on what they should do. Yeah, excellent. So in your uh, business now at, at Startup Station, as you talk to entrepreneurs and engage with them, what would you say are the biggest things that they're missing? What are the things that, that they really need to improve on? Uh, well, I mean, the traditional, uh, I would say, uh, shortfalls come around uh, being able to really think about their business model from the financial perspective, right? Uh, I think uh, they often lack an understanding of how uh, long things will take or how uh, expensive it will be for them to reach their financial goals. So the revenue goals come from the sky as opposed to from thinking what their marketing strategy is going to be, what their sales strategy is going to be, and, and how it's going to work through, um, you know, th through the point of generating demand. Uh, the other thing is, you know, most entrepreneurs haven't done their work on validating product market fit, so they haven't thought about whether somebody actually needs their product, right? They may have an idea, but maybe it's not such a good idea. Uh, and it's a reason why a lot of early stage ventures fail is because they're not able to generate traction. So I would say that's another thing to really focus on. And uh, it's probably even before you start thinking about financials uh, and before you start spending a lot of money on your product, you should do as much work as possible on uh, uh, validating your idea, validating product market fit, you know, researching um, customers, researching competition and really making sure that it's worth going forward. Um, I would say this is a big problem. Uh, and then, um, you know, a lot of founders have, um, I would say, issues putting a good team together. And team is everything because, as we've discussed before, the business model will change. There are going to be a lot of challenges. The business needs of the company will evolve as it grows rapidly. And it's the core team of people that uh, is going to keep the company together that's so important. And so um, being able to find those people and making sure that you – uh, or on the same page, you don't have any conflict with the founders, um, uh, it's a super important. So it's not a financial issue, it's not something that I get involved with, but that's something that I see ruins a lot of companies, even with good products and, you know, and good financials. Yes, as, as, they, as many smart people have often said, uh, having an A team is much more important than having an A product. Exactly. Right. Just look yeah. at Slack. You know, Slack that just went public was a game, and then uh, they didn't even use, they didn't even think of using a platform that went public as the main product, and then they pivoted. And look what happened. Yes, yes. And oftentimes the sort of open openness and willingness to do that pivot and to say it's time to move on. Our original concept is is not working. Uh, how do you help people kind of sort through that decision and deciding, okay, when is the right time to make a pivot? Right. So, well, that's exactly what the financial model is for, because when you build it, you also create your financial goals. And as part of creating your financial goals, you create financial metrics that you're supposed to meet, right? And that measure the effectiveness of your strategy and that give you feedback on the health, the strength and weaknesses of your financial performance. Right, for various parts of your business model, for costs and for revenues, for user acquisition or customer acquisition, et cetera. And so uh, as long as you do the review uh, of your financial results on a regular basis, at least three months, every three months, and you reconcile your pro forma projections, which are the things that you expect to happen with your actual projections, and you really think why, what things didn't work as you've expected, or what things did work, that will give you a lot of intelligence that you need in order to make good decisions um, in terms of how to go forward. And uh, if if I was to engage with you as, a, as an entrepreneur and you helped me, uh, I took your courses, you helped me sort through my 
financial models. Um, is there an ongoing sort of relationship we can have so that I you can you can help me have that discipline to look at it every three months and you provide another set of uh, non non biased eyes to look at it and and help me sort through that conversation with myself about hey are we really doing well or am I fooling myself and should we think about pivoting? Absolutely, I mean uh, I'm a, I'll consult for uh, as many hours as uh, somebody will uh, hire me for. I mean, yeah. provided that I'm not at full capacity. But yes, I mean, absolutely, sure. I work with uh, the clients for uh, as long as they need me. And uh, sometimes I even stay on as an advisor. And um, often, actually, when the clients start pitching, they list me as part of their team. So sometimes I go to meetings with investors and I explain the model to them and explain some of the things that we've discussed to them from the financial perspective. Yeah, because I think one of the things uh, that, I, that I've that i observed uh, is that uh, – People do these plans, people, uh, you know, work out business models, financial projections, et cetera, and they raise the capital um, and they put that in the drawer and they never look at it again. And to, to sort of maintain that discipline of periodically looking at where you are, the progress you've made and being really honest about it. And saying, you know, is this going well? Is it not going well? Because, again, typically everyone spends all the money they say they're going to spend, but it's pretty rare that they make all the revenue that they say they're going to make. Exactly. So, you know, uh, uh, being honest about that and being and, and having a process for reviewing that periodically, I think, is really important. And, and I think that's it's really nice that that you will do that uh, for for the people that you engage with. Absolutely. And then, you know, what I try to explain is that the purpose of the financial model is not to predict what you're going to make, right? It's not a crystal ball. It's a map you can use to execute against your strategy. And sometimes you need to update the map or change the map completely, which is pivoting. But without a map, it's much harder to uh, survive in the forest, which is entrepreneurship. So, right. <laughs> yes, you can, right? Are you going to be able to exit the forest successfully? Maybe, right? Some people will get lucky without a map, but most people need a map. Yeah. So, uh, you have this uh, TV show you're getting ready to start filming. You're expanding your business to uh, India and to Russia. Yep. Uh, what are, what other wonderful, fabulous things are you doing? Well, I'm also in talks with a few European countries to expand my curriculum there, but those are in the much earlier stages. But ideally, I'd like to launch, uh, you know, all around the world. And uh, I'm also in talks with a couple of universities in the United States, but that's a very long process. But yeah, ideally, I'd like to, um, you know, launch my curriculum in uh, as many. Uh, structured places as possible. Yeah. So right now, are you uh, a one person operation and you're doing all these things? No, I have some help. I'm not as efficient as I may have led yourself. <laughs> you <to> be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well I'm thinking to myself. I, 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 I cannot do everything, but you know, I have a, a three people that work with me and I can get more if there's a need, but uh, three people that work with me regularly. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. Uh, are there things that uh, I should have asked you? I want to start wrapping this up. We've been going almost 35 minutes here. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, are there things that I should have asked you or other points you'd like to make? Um, I think um, the only thing I would like to say to all aspiring entrepreneurs is um, um, number one is not to be afraid to pursue your dreams because you don't want to live your life in regret but two, to be very disciplined in the way how you pursue them and have a very uh, rigorous process in how you evaluate risks and which risks you're going to end up taking. And I think if you combine your fearlessness with uh, uh, a framework for evaluating risks, you have a higher chance of uh, uh, being successful and also knowing what you don't know and get the help that you need. You know, do not think that you need to know everything and you can be successful at, at um everything that's not possible oh wow that was a, a great summary and a wonderful way to uh, wrap this uh, episode up uh, thank you very much victoria for taking the time to share your story with us thank uh, you very much for having me yeah it certainly is an unconventional path and uh 
I wish you the best in launching your products in, uh, in other countries. And I'm going to look forward to finding the social movement on, uh, you said Amazon Prime, if I remember That's right. correctly. Yep, Amazon Video, yep. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you very, very much. And have a great day as well. It was a pleasure to be uh, on your podcast. Well, Bela, you've done it again. You found yet another person with a really interesting story. I mean, actress and producer and all these things, right? I don't know how you do it, but it's amazing. Um, so, yeah, A, a person with a really interesting career path and how she kind of wound up um, being an entrepreneurship educator, right? To me, it was just a, an interesting, made sense, logical, but a really interesting career path. Um, what do you think uh, the value of the startup station business model is? So I think it, it's an, an another alternative or another option uh, for someone who says, hey, I have a business idea. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to do with it, how to approach it, uh, what's the next step. And there's various different organizations that exist out there. You know, most uh, states or counties or uh, organizations, uh, government organizations have some form of uh, counseling, coaching, assistance uh, for people who are interested in starting a business. It's usually, you know, under some economic development agency. Uh, lots of universities, uh, you know, in addition to offering MBAs, uh, some of them have incubators. Uh, as do uh, their private incubator models where you can go and get some help and some coaching. And uh, in some of the larger metropolitan areas, uh, you can often find the Chamber of Commerce or other organizations that can provide you with uh, some of this coaching. Uh, so there's lots of these organizations uh, that can provide this assistance out there. And I think this is another flavor of it. Uh, you know, the, the notion of uh, accelerators and incubators is one that's been around for oh, 30, 40 years now. And uh, it has demonstrated that there is value in sort of those organizations and how they disseminate that information and uh, help young entrepreneurs uh, grow their business, think about their business uh, and refine their business. Yeah, it's intense. It can be very expensive, right? It's typically not convenient, right? Um, they're located in large urban areas, right? And not all large urban areas. So there's really some limitations to how useful these, um, these uh, uh, incubators and accelerators can be, especially if you're balancing family and, and, and a job and all, and all these types of constraints that we're all dealing with. Um, so it's an interesting model, right? This is inexpensive, relatively speaking. It's very flexible and convenient, right? Um, you can do this from anywhere, anytime. Um, so it really has some, some, some value, I think. Who do you think this approach would be best for, Bela? What types of entrepreneurs? So I think uh, it certainly works uh, wonderfully, wonderfully well for folks who are in non-major entrepreneurial zones of the world, right? So Silicon Valley, New York City, uh, Austin in the United States are sort of pretty big entrepreneurial zones. So if you're in a small town uh, and, or a small city and maybe that part of the world doesn't have the infrastructure that you need in order to get this coaching and advice and education, this is great for that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, this online approach, you know, given what's going on in the digital world these days, the quality of, of that interchange and that uh, of what you can do online has grown drastically in the last 10 years. So you can get really high quality uh, interactions, uh, rich engagements, and you can do that online. So for folks who are, are more rural, uh, live in smaller places, I think this is perfect. And I think it's also perfect for folks who... You know, these incubators uh, that exist, uh, universities uh, and many of these economic development uh, organizations are really focused on big, high potential businesses. They want to hit home runs or, or they want to be able to say, hey, I help this business or we, you know, so-and-so economic development organization help this business grow. And, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But many, many of the businesses that are started in this world 
are are you know if they get to a million dollars in sales a year or maybe a couple million in sales that's wonderful the founders are happy they have a couple of employees and that's great uh, so I also think this is this is good for that segment of of entrepreneurial startups that uh, maybe some of the other organizations tend to not pay as much attention to. Yeah, and you don't need a lot of technological expertise or engineering expertise. You don't need, need big manufacturing facilities for this. The logistics are fairly straightforward. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of the people that we've had on the show so far, right, are these types of, you know, might be considered smaller scale and then less glitzy or less sexy types of industries. But nonetheless, it's a real huge driver of economic development and 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 personal satisfaction, right? So, yeah, this is an interesting model for those groups of people. Bail, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, it, you know, I checked out her couple of her videos and stuff, and they're pretty good. Uh, and, and I think there's value there. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's it's good. As an entrepreneur, it's good to have choices. And... Uh, this is this is one of those places where where you have a choice to engage with this and it's good quality stuff and you know let's face it uh if i take an entrepreneurship 101 course in college uh if i take it at 10 different colleges uh 97% of the content's going to be the same so so as these industries mature sort of the the content and and the things that are valuable and the things that are less valuable sort of sort themselves out and and they become more definitive right i you know the 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 book for chemistry 101 probably hasn't changed in 50 years they cover the same stuff so that's sort of entrepreneurship is maturing so and when that happens that enables you to get that information from more outlets kind of more different ways of consuming that information. And I think that this is one of the great things about that. Yeah, that's the knowledge part. And then there's the skills part and the networking part. And I think there's certain people, Bela, and you and I have talked about this before. There's certain people that can thrive online in terms of building relationships and building networks and can learn skills and be coached right online. There's certain coaches that can coach effectively online. And there's others of us, maybe we're older, or maybe we just have an aversion to technology, right? Um, that that aren't used to this kind of model, they aren't comfortable with it. Um, so again, I think that might be another sorting mechanism for people who want to use this, you have to be, um, if you just want the knowledge, that's fine. But if you want the coaching, and you want the networking in an online um, world, you got to be comfortable using those tools. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one, my, one of my sons uh, works from home four days a week. He's a software guy, computer guy. And uh, so he has lots of engagements. He has customers he deals with uh, and, and co-workers that uh, he, some of which he's never met, never seen. It's all a totally 100% online uh, relationship. And I think uh, uh, some individuals are very comfortable with that. And the tools exist now that you can have those meaningful engagements uh, for other folks, you know, that are maybe from a different generation, uh, the, the model that we grew up with is eyeball to eyeball communication. And, uh, so it may not be right for you. So I think this is great. Uh, this is a, a way that you can get that. And, you know, uh, I do some shopping on Amazon because it works really well for me. I can do it from my couch. But there's other shopping I do. I want to go to the store and I want to engage with the salesperson or I want to touch and feel the product. So I think this is this is sort of like that. It, it, it gives you the opportunity to obtain this information in a way that works best for you. Yeah. And I guess I'll throw the other thing in this is looking at this more internationally. There are certain countries and cultures where online isn't as effective for a variety of reasons, whether it's trust, whether it's the, the level of directness a culture really wants to have. Like here in Germany, I think um, we don't do online education nearly as much as they do in the U.S., and we don't do online coaching nearly as much. So if you know, you're know you you're working with half your team is German and half your team is, is from the U United States, um, th you know this is something to consider too. So there's lots of cultural issues, um, y you know, I think, with, with choosing the right mechanism based on where your team is located. Yeah, so this is this this is another form of access to information, yep. and and uh, you know, figure out if it works for you. So I think the real takeaway here is you know there's there's different types of uh, support mechanisms 
uh, for entrepreneurs, whether it be higher ed or incubators, accelerators, local small business development centers, uh, classes like this. You can hire coaches, uh, et cetera. You know, we've, we've had a couple of guests on, on the podcast that are sort of in the coaching business. Uh, so there's lots of different opportunities out there. So you got to figure out, number one, what works for you as an individual and what's the right approach for the business you're in. You know, some businesses, uh, let's say I wanted to open up uh, a small business in my hometown and basically, you know, my footprint for my business is my hometown. Well, that's a totally different set of people I need to engage with and interact with than if I'm opening up a business that's going to sell products or services worldwide. Uh, so, so you got to think about who your customers are, uh, who your relationships need to be with, and make sure you use the support mechanisms that fit within that model that you're having for your business. What do you think, Mike? Agreed. I think you nailed it right on the head. One size doesn't fit all, as my friend Farzad Mahmoudi always likes to say. Um, you got to find the right size uh, sweater uh, that fits your bot, right? Uh, it makes you look good. So I think that it was great that um, you, uh, you, you met with Victoria today and had an interesting conversation with her. And I think that there's this just one more piece of the puzzle that uh, hopefully our listeners can, can take a look at and, uh, and decide how they want to proceed uh, in their entrepreneurial vision and mission. Yeah. And remember, the name of the podcast is The Unconventional Path. So yeah. we're trying to find people exactly like this, uh, not, not necessarily stuff that uh, you can read about or, or hear about in all sorts of other places, but sort of the things that are unique in some way and uh, are an interesting story. Nicely said, Bella. All right, let's wrap this up. So listeners, uh, we are once again overjoyed that you uh, decide to join us in our podcasting adventure for this week. Uh, and we hope you found the last hour or so interesting and thought-provoking, just like we did. As usual, we have two small requests. One is if you have questions about what we've discussed today, suggestions about topics or some future potential guests that might work, uh, please get in touch with us. Our email is bela.and.mike at gmail.com. And second, if you like what we're doing, uh, please hit subscribe or like in your podcast app uh, and even consider writing us a quick review if you know others that might find us interesting, please share us with them. Uh, we're always uh, interested in kind of building our reach and building our footprint. So thanks for spending time with us. We look forward to you joining us for our next episode. So signing off from my home office in upstate New York, this is Bela. Hey, Mike, see you next week. Thanks, Bela. Sounds great. And from over here across the Atlantic in beautiful Münster, Germany, uh, we'll see you next week. And that's it. Bye-bye. This podcast is produced for Mike and I by our friends at Busy Media of Schenectady, New York. They can be found at busymedia.co.